HOA story time with an update, the rental property from heck. During my tenure, I have seen all sorts of weird appeals and issues that we had to resolve from pond management problems to neighborly disputes. The issue is, this story, however, centers around a specific renter in our neighborhood along with their terrible management company. The main story. At the end of every quarterly meeting that we have for the community, members have a chance to stay back and review issues with the board case by case. Typically, this consists of community members who have fines that want to appeal or settle. This time, however, a regular attendee came in which, well, surprised all of us. She had never once had a fine, helped with some committees, and had two amazing kids, one of which was special needs. This is important later. She sat down and calmly sat down a folder in front of us, and that's when I knew she was serious. Then she began to explain how she needed help from the board with an issue with her neighbor. She described in painful detail about how her neighbor had been digging up and taking her flowers and had kept flipping around the basketball hoop that her special needs son used regularly. She had even installed a camera and had video evidence proof which she showed to us. Immediately, I became concerned and told her to call the police immediately. She looked down and informed us that she had, and the police told her to go through the HOA first. While that still made no sense to me, I said that we could look into how we could help. She thanked us with teary eyes and left after that. I walked out of the meeting, scratching my head on how I could help without even really knowing what I could do. When I got home, I looked up the address of the neighbor that was bothering her to discover that the house belonged to a renter and the property owner had a long history of issues with the HOA. While I am not really allowed to discuss specifics here, let's just say that the property has had 10 tenants in 7 years and still has some serious outstanding issues with the board. I looked up the property company and I discovered that they owned over 50 houses across multiple towns in my area and had a D- rating with the Better Business Bureau. I contacted my other board members and asked their opinion on the situation while providing them with the findings of my research. One of them reminded me that the management company had sent a representative to the meeting prior and tried to appeal a whole host of fines with the excuse that they simply did not want to pay them. I had honestly forgotten that that was the same house. Not to mention, they also tried to claim that since their tenants did not want to pay, neither should the property company. So we denied all of their requests since they were years behind in many fees and dues. I drove by the property and realized how bad it looked. The grass was over a foot high, there were dog chains in the front, and their flowers were of course immaculate, and the neighbor's houses were missing. I saw the basketball hoop flipped around for myself and I could not help but let my jaw drop. I could not imagine how that lady felt for the atrocities that she had to deal with having neighbors like that. I took some pictures and drove back. The Revenge I contacted the board's legal consult and asked if there was anything that we could do to help. Since the property ownership company had refused to pay dues and fines for over eight years since buying the house, we did have the authority to foreclose and then put the house for sale through the bank that had the loan, which I thought was a little strange that corporate housing company would mortgage it given the amount of houses that they owned, but uh, oh well. I did not like the idea of foreclosing just yet, so I set up a meeting request with the tenant. I sent a request for him to talk to the landowner since we were not allowed to interact with renters and made my list of items. When the next meeting rolled around, the same representative from the company that showed up a few meetings ago was there. He stayed around and when it was time for his individual time slot, he sat down and calmly asked what was wrong. My VP started with the list of fines and past due payments and asked if and when they planned to pay it. He replied calmly that they had no intention of paying them. I then asked him if he knew that that means the company could lose the house to foreclosure. He looked sheepish for a second and then replied that they had great lawyers since they had dealt with this through other neighborhoods. 
We tried to reason with them a bit more, but it was clear that they thought they were above the community standards and owed us nothing. So I personally like to wait 10 years before finally deciding to foreclose on a delinquent house, since no account has ever had that long of a history with the HOA, as we're usually able to resolve the issue. HOAs need to use that authority extremely carefully. Since this was clearly never going to be resolved, the board voted to start the proceedings to foreclose on the property. I reached out to the other HOAs where the company held property and found out that two of them were doing the same thing. While it's currently an ongoing case, there is a chance that we can also file a class action lawsuit against the company for property negligence. We'll see what happens, but I would love to run them out of business since all they do is get bad renters, ruin houses, and ignore HOA rules. I also got into contact with our community's police contact and informed him of the flower stealing and trespassing. He was stunned to hear that the department had turned this lady away and offered to help. She reached out to me a few days ago to let me know that there is now an investigation into the matter and that she's trying to sue him for stealing property. I offered to testify if it ever came to that and I am sure that she will win. The update. Nine months ago, I posted about a rental property that was out of control due to a poor investment property firm. After a long legal battle, the board was able to prove to a property judge that the land was out of control and was not maintained. We secured a lien of 20% of the home for all of the fines and unpaid violations, and the judge ordered them to be paid immediately. Otherwise, they would face an expedited foreclosure since the property owner was acting in bad faith and my state has a special process for these edge cases. As of yesterday, the company who owned the property declared themselves insolvent since three other surrounding HOAs imposing similar fines on their properties were included in the ruling. We cannot wait to recoup the damages and we are working our local foreclosure management team to try and help guide the process in selecting a new homeowner since any party with a 15% stake gets weird voting rights. We're really hoping for a tenant that wants to take care of them and want to avoid another investment company with a poor record of house maintenance. As for the poor homeowner whose flowers were stolen, the board paid for the neighborhood's landscaper to professionally install them after the current renter left a few months ago. The homeowner's property looks awesome, and they've recently joined our social committee to welcome new people into the neighborhood. While I have to keep it very vague, there are also criminal charges being investigated, which will unfortunately take more time to process. While not every story has a happy ending, the diligent work of this homeowner saved the community and others from a terrible homeowner. Always document these issues, since you never know how someone else may be able to help you with it. Do you think this HOA Karen got justice, or what would have you done in this situation? You ever had a bad neighbor? Let me know. Nightmare HOA Stories Whiskey isn't enough says, Oh boy, do I have a good one. Obligatory not me, but my best friend. My best friend, S, grew up in suburban Arizona. His family owned their home and rarely had problems with their HOA other than it being generally fascist. It all started with some cardboard boxes. S and his sister, at the ripe age of around 6 or 7, wanted to make a fort in their front yard, and their dad, being the great guy that he was, helped them build a crappy cardboard box fort for them to play in. Being kids, they played in the fort for a couple of hours and proceeded to get distracted playing elsewhere. Not a day later, they received posted notices on the door and phone calls informing them that they need to clean the unsightly garbage out of their yard or be faced with fines. It wasn't a huge deal, but they left the family a bit jaded towards the HOA. Fast forward a handful of years later, S's dad decides that he wants to paint the house. Now, if you don't know, most HOAs have strict rules on the color and sand templates for you to pick off of. He said that the templates ranged from tan to slightly different tan. S's dad finds a color that he likes that's more of a greenish tan and sends it, paints the whole house. The HOA proceeds to have a meltdown because they painted their house outside of the allowed color spectrum. S's dad said, no freaking way, it's basically the same color, I'm not repainting my entire house. 
So the HOA hires a contractor to come down with a paint color tester and post notices on their door with a detailed analysis of how his color is Yucatan and it doesn't fit the spectrum. And if they don't repaint it by the end of the month, they will be fined. Instead of folding, S's mom finds out when the next meeting is and discovers that no one votes. The same dude has been president of the HOA for way too long and there is some shady crap going on in terms of contracting. So she walks around the neighborhood the next few weeks campaigning and runs. She wins by a landslide. It was the largest turnout for an HOA meeting since its inception. Apparently, everyone was also sick and tired of the bullcrap, but they just bent over. So, S's mom is elected president and discovers that the previous regime was doing the old hook up my son-in-law by contracting his company and pay him stupid amounts of money to water the sandwash bullcrap. She quickly ends all that crap. Rather than change any rules other than a few stupid ones, the S family office just decided to refuse to enforce any of them. S's mom goes years as president. Recently, she decided, screw it, and didn't show up to the election, and someone else got elected. Now the new guy is trying to enforce the old rules, but everyone is so used to the freedom, there's a freaking war going on. I run farther says, my old HOA was going through that around the time that I moved in. I was a new homeowner and rather young. My neighbors were all 50 plus, and my wife and I were in our mid-twenties. I loved my neighborhood because it was so quiet. So I decided to take an interest in my local community, so I went to the HOA meeting. Three guys showed up about 45 minutes late. I waited around since the firefighters at the station that we used said they were always late. They said, great, if we can get three more people here, we can vote to end the HOA. It caught me off guard. I guess from the very beginning, the HOA had been trying to dissolve itself, but didn't have enough members to show up to take an actual vote. By the time I sold my house eight years later, they still existed, but hadn't had a dues payment in six years from any of the households on the street to include the HOA board members. Rax Dominus says, other way around, my mom was the president of the HOA for her backwoods little neighborhood. Maybe 30 people lived there. Everyone used one well. The well had a problem once, so no one had water. It was $800 for a temporary fix or $2,000 for a permanent fix. My mom had a meeting where out of the 30 people, five showed up. No big deal. Those five people funded the $800 to get it fixed since they've been without water for almost a week. No one would split the cost and the dues were so low that it didn't cover them, so those five people paid for everyone's well. Well, in preparation for the actual fix, she tried to raise money, but only got halfway there when it broke. My mom went door to door asking for everyone's share before they'd fix it. It was like $50. It was another week without water. No one would pay for the well that they all used. Finally, around half of the neighborhood raised the money to fix it. Later, they all had a giant barbecue at my parents' house, but the people who didn't pay weren't invited. Eleven Ghost says, Like two days before I bought a condo, I was told that I would be blocked from moving in unless I paid the first month of HOA dues. So the morning of the closing, I went to the management company's office and dropped off a check. I moved in without issue and then continued to pay my dues on time each month. Like four years later, I got an invoice for $800 plus. Apparently, they never cashed that first check. So when I paid the next month, they credited it toward my first month and assessed a late fee. This continued for four years where every month's check was credited to the previous month. I got in a huge argument with the accounting office and they wouldn't budge on the 800 plus in late fees. I was irate. My d Richard fell off, posted, it didn't happen to me, but the city I grew up in was briefly in national news because the HOA was trying to force an elderly couple to give up their only grandchild for adoption after her parents were killed in a traffic accident. The little girl had no other living family and had watched her parents die 
But the HOA wanted her gone because it was a retirement community and told them to give her up or be homeless. You won't stop smoking on your porch at night? Guess we'll burn our house down, posted by ULFR. Hi all, just found out why there were a bunch of flashing lights and loud sirens on the street behind mine last night, and I am gobsmacked. The family that used to live in the house behind mine, whoever, so helpfully called the police on me after I gave them a heads up about their Wi-Fi has moved out. A new family has moved in. Our houses are separated by a couple hundred feet and a brush line. I found this out because they came to talk to me last week about my smoking the funny before I go to bed on my porch and how the smell is terrible and it's bothering them and I just need to not do that. As a note, I smoke precisely one half gram of the funny on my screened in porch before bed perhaps three to four times a week. The likelihood that any of the smoke from that is going anywhere near their house is slim to none. I told the new back neighbors, I'll turn a ceiling fan on to thin out the smell, but I'm not going to get eaten alive by bugs just before bed because they don't want me to smoke on my own property and the porch is screened in. I guess this answer didn't satisfy them because last night one of them came up with a cunning plan to get back at me. They dug a hole in their lawn, built a fire with a bunch of green pine wood so it would be extra smoky, started the fire, and then put a box fan pointed at my porch next to the fire and went inside. Three guesses what happened. If you guessed that they set their own house on fire, you would be correct. One of their next door neighbors called 911 because some cinders from the fire set my back neighbor's house on fire. I have no idea how much the fire damaged the house, only that the people who lived there got arrested and given an impressive set of fines for negligence and a bunch of other things. Did I mention that my county is under a fire weather warning and all of those fines are multiplied? The juiciest part and the reason I decided to post on here about it was one of the cops was talking to the neighbors who were going on and on about the awful funny smell that I was causing and making the house uninhabitable. The cop sniffs a little bit and tells them that's not that, that's a skunk. Karen story time entitled woman once man with cancer's chair posted by raised anchor 68. This was over 20 years ago. I was invited to a co-worker's wedding and it was small budget and big energy. The ceremony was to be in a garden and there was going to be more people than seats. The invitation politely asked that the seating be for immediate family and those who might need it more than others. I arrived and met my other co-workers. We were all young and fit then so standing was no issue for us. We were there early and we got a spot near the front and close to the chairs. The chairs were in two sections with a path in the middle and the front row of each section was reserved for the bride and groom's family. The rest of the chairs were up for grabs. A couple arrived, both late 20s, and took the seats at the end of the row behind the bride's family row, just near us. The man of the couple did not look well and his hair was missing. A few people made their way over to say hello to him. He smiled as he talked and he looked happy to be there. The chairs filled up fast with the older attendees and people that arrived after that took standing places at the sides like us. I checked my watch and start time was not far away. A few minutes later, I saw a young woman walk in. She was in her early 20s and she walked along close to the chairs, looking around as if she was searching for someone. She got all the way up to near us and then tapped the unwell man on the shoulder. I thought she might have known him until I heard her say, excuse me, can I have that seat? He looked at her as if he didn't understand, so she helped him by repeating, can I have that seat? Why, he asked, and I thought the same question. Because you're a man and I'm a woman, you should be a gentleman and offer me that seat. Every conversation nearby suddenly stopped. People turned and looked. The bride's family in the front row must have known this man and they all turned around. A few of them stood up and looked as if they were about to interject when the man's partner leaned in front of him and said loudly, he has cancer and he needs to sit down, okay? 
the young woman looked around and realized that she had a lot of attention. How was I supposed to know? She protested and then walked quickly away and disappeared in the crowd behind the chairs. The wedding went well after that. I spoke to my co-worker when he returned from his honeymoon and the man was his wife's cousin. The young woman was his wife's co-worker but they were not close. I did learn over the years that followed that the man ended up beating the cancer and became a father. I do not know what happened to the young woman because I never asked. You gotta love a wholesome Karen story with a good ending like that, but I can't help but wonder what happened to her. What do you think? I used to exclusively sell cell phones inside of a middle class retail chain. This service was actually run by a different company than the retail chain itself. We would provide all the nicer cell phones like iPhones and Samsung Galaxies, 800 to 1500 bucks, and the retail chain provided the cheaper prepaid cell phones. My team and I would sell all of the phones, but only we could sell the nicer phones. At the time of this incident, I was the team lead for my store, meaning that when it came to the nicer phones, I was the final word. We never discounted the phones directly, but various service providers would authorize rebates and incentives, and that was it. When you bought a nicer phone from us, we would directly pull up your service provider account and set up the phone directly and they would provide any discounts or credits or rewards. We were also able to report fraud through this system. The story. It was a slow day at the cell phone station, so I decided to do a cold sell lap of the store, leaving a newer team member, let's call her Tina, in charge of the cell phone area for the 20 to 30 minutes that it would take to find someone to buy a phone. I was gone maybe 10 minutes before I get a call from the store manager asking me to get back to the cell phone station because there was an issue. When I get back, I see Tina is about to cry while an overweight Karen is holding a small piece of paper and yelling at her. As I get closer, I hear the word coupon and I immediately know what's about to go down. Less than a week ago, Tina had accepted several fake coupons, which was my day off and her partner called out without telling me, and severely discounted the nicer phones on the fake coupons. She was new, and we hadn't covered that you can never discount the phones yourself, nor that we had never had coupons for these either. Afterwards, I made it clear to her that our team will never discount the phones. Cut back to the present, I see the store manager watching from around the corner. I waved him off and strode forward. Facing Tina, I asked what's going on. Tina let me know that the Karen wanted the newest iPhone and was trying to use a 99% off coupon. Before she could continue, the Karen cut in. I don't know what the issue is. She accepted these coupons last week from my friends. Karen then pushed the coupon towards Tina like that would magically change the situation. I told Tina to take an extra 15 in the back and then turn back to the Karen. I was ticked and I think it was showing just a bit because Karen flinched. While I hadn't been in too much trouble over the coupon issue the week prior, I had been passed over for a promotion to another store because of it and I was not in the mood. Not only was she basically trying to steal a phone, she had specifically targeted Tina. Who told you Tina would accept this ridiculously fake coupon? Was it Kathy? We had records for the nicer phones and Kathy's account was banned from every one of our locations because of the prior incident. Karen became pale at that last question and I think she realized that she was in trouble. She tried to mention something about the retail chain accepting these types of coupons and I laughed. I explained that the retail chain didn't have any say over the nicer phones and that we worked for a different company. She tried to insist that we had already taken these coupons before, so why couldn't she use them now? At this point, I was done and then I told her, in no uncertain terms, that we will never discount the nicer phones and that she would not be purchasing phones from this location, period. Fortunately for me, the store manager had hung around and I called him over. Can you call asset protection? I picked up the coupon and handed it to him. Using a fake coupon is stealing and this woman also knows Kathy from last week. Karen tried to run but we were lucky in that the police were already at the entrance for an entirely separate issue. 
I heard later that Karen did get past them initially, but the police were informed of the situation and were able to detain Karen before she made it to her car and then arrested Karen. Unfortunately, I don't know what happened after that, but I did give a statement about this incident two weeks later to the police, so I think charges were filed. I literally laughed when I read 99% off because who even tries to think that's believable? What do you think? HOA Karen demands what I do on my property, but I'm not even in the HOA. Click the video on your screen so you don't miss the crazy fallout of this one, and I'll see you there.